Teresa, thank you so much. It's so good to see you joining us. Uh, Olivia and I are very pleased to have you. I think okay. we said briefly there, but so pleased to have you, so honored to have you. We've been following your work with Africa.com for, for, for throughout this uh, COVID-19 period, and we really appreciate all the you know, conversations and the high-level discussions you've been facilitating. So thank you so much for partnering and supporting us as well as Scale Up Africa. And uh, what we'll do is hand over to you to start your, your keynote address. Okay, great. So I guess we shall start. First of all, um, again, thank you for inviting me to be here. I'm very excited to uh, be a part of your effort. Um, so today's talk is about five considerations for growing your African business. And I think that you're going to help me uh, do a poll. I thought we would start by engaging your audience. And um, I don't know who on your side is geared up to do this, but we want to do a poll to see um, what the audience thinks about how many companies in Africa earn annual revenues of a billion U.S. dollars or more. Thank All right, you. Paul, Paul is launched. We'll close it in about 10 seconds. So seven, 10, a couple of you are voting, please. The live poll, um, poll is live on the link, live on the link. We're going to close it in about 10 seconds. 32 people have voted. Let's keep the energy up. Let's engage. Let's engage. How many companies in Africa earn revenues of a billion USD or more is the question that is live from our speaker, Teresa Clark. And the poll will end in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. We have 71 votes so far, 3 two and one and poll and we'll share the results now live and there you have it ladies and gentlemen the result from the voting link about 25 percent over a hundred about 29 percent from between 11 to 99, 23 percent between 6 to 10. The lowest percentage, which is really good to see that, at zero. So uh, there's a 21 percentage share between one to five. Teresa, we take it back to you. Good. Well, thank you for doing the poll so nicely. Technology is amazing. You guys have mastered it. Um, and it is great to be able to see how few people thought that it was zero. Um, the actual number is much bigger than any of these. The actual number of companies in Africa with revenues over a billion US dollars or more is 400. There are over 400 companies on the continent that have revenues in that league. And I think that it's important to start there because the theme of this conference is around growing your business. And I think that we should start from the top and look at what does every African entrepreneur hope to do. And certainly every entrepreneur in Africa hopes to scale to a certain size. And it's nice to know that the continent supports 400 companies that have achieved a billion or more. So I think that should be our starting point and the aspiration for all of us today in talking about scaling African businesses. I think that in doing so, we should also recognize um, where we are right now and that these are unusual times and these unusual times call for unusual responses. And so living um, as we are now um, during an economic crisis, that uh, is impacting both entrepreneurs and large businesses alike, it creates both unusual challenges but unusual opportunities. And we know that so many companies are born out of opportunities from challenging times that this should be an inspiration for um, entrepreneurs today. To, again, as we talked a little bit about New York and, and various cities that experience this before and after a crisis. Um, it's in times like this that great businesses are born, things that um, appreciate the new normal, those who are able to see beyond the crisis. Um, I think it's also fair to say, and this is, I think, a, a phrase that I heard early on in the crisis, and I think that it's very, very um, apropos, and that is that those businesses that are thriving now during the crisis are the ones that are going to survive and thrive going forward. And so ask yourself some tough questions about your ability to succeed in this moment. Certainly um, being able to survive virtually is a critical key, a critical skill, a critical element 
to, um, to being able to survive today. Those organizations that are not good at reinventing themselves, those organizations that are stuck in old ways, those organizations that are not capable of uh, moving forward with technology and with evolving um, a background of circumstances are not going to survive. They may make it for another bit of time, but they're not going to make it in the long term. And so I think that one should really think about where we are and how to make the most of the changes that are taking place, wholesale changes across industries, across nations, across the world, and use that as a jumping off point uh, for scaling your business, for pivoting, for, for moving forward. The second consideration, there are five of them, um, is to solve uniquely African problems. Africa has unique challenges and unique opportunities. And adjusting your thinking to how to fill these big voids and how to solve these uniquely African issues creates opportunity for scale at the national level, the regional level, the continental level, the global level. And so I think that it is around shifting one's thinking. Sometimes I speak with entrepreneurs who have a really good idea and they may be thinking about it from, um, I would say more of a supply side, think of it, without thinking about it from the demand side. Shift your thinking to what is there a huge demand for? What is an opportunity that really needs to be solved? And there's so, you know, Africa is filled with um, a number of, I mean, just an endless number of, of voids that if sorted out could create huge opportunities for people. So we think, you know, for example, um, uh, you know, there's some examples that you know, many people on this phone probably know about, but you, know, you think about the, the matter from a health perspective of being able to deliver blood. Um, that's a void that exists in some African nations, particularly in Nigeria. If you find yourself in the hospital and you need blood, that the infrastructure that might exist in Europe or North America to match blood donors to people in need just doesn't exist. And so, you know, some entrepreneurs have come up with sort of the Uber of blood delivery. And that's something that just fills such a void and creates such an impact. And that's something that can scale. It's something that uh, just creates long-term value and impact. So trying to fill some of these voids and solve these problems is, is a real way to shift one's approach. And, um, and, and, and really position yourself for scale. Um, I'm going to do a little plug, by the way. Um, I think that many people who've watched the Africa.com webinars know that we have partnered with Harvard Business School. And there are two faculty members from Harvard Business School who are launching a course called Africa Live. And this online course uh, helps you to think in this way. That's really what the purpose of this course is, is to shift thinking around how to succeed as an entrepreneur in emerging economies and to, uh, to shift one's thinking around this scale issue. So if you're interested um, as a member of the Africa.com community, you get a 10% discount. Come look us up online, go to our website, virtualconferenceafrica.com, and you'll get a discount to this course that helps to think about this way. Um, the third point is that a rising tide lifts all boats. And so it's important to think about um, the macro trends that will affect your business. And when you think about those macro trends, this again is a way to marry your business plan with elements that will ensure that you can scale to the greatest degree possible. And I know everyone here knows these things, but I'm just noting them for purposes of this presentation. These are some of the big themes. Um, we know that Africa has a huge population. We know that this population is urbanizing. We know that this urbanization creates tremendous opportunities because consumer behaviors are different in an urban environment than they are in a rural environment. People in rural environments, um, you know, just something as simple as soap. Um, people in rural communities tend to use 
one form of soap and they'll use that same soap you know to do many different things to wash clothes for showering you know, as shampoo and you know somehow you know you get to an urban area and the likes of you know unilever and uh, colgate somehow convince us that you know you need to have you know five different kinds of soap you need one for your hair you need one for your body you need one for your face you need one for your clothes um these you know these trends um as people urbanize create opportunities if you think about the things that people do once they become urban that they didn't do when they were rural um, industrialization is something that has become very important and people have looked at a lot harder from a macro policy perspective in light of the pandemic and that is what are we manufacturing on the continent are we manufacturing to serve our own needs or can we continue to be reliant on trade because we've seen that in moments like this, it's not only the continent, but every country around the world has started to look at its own supply chain and recognize that it wants to have greater independence by manufacturing internally within its own borders because you recognize how fragile those international supply chains are. And when they're not there, you're left vulnerable. So what sort of industrialization opportunities are there? What exists that you can make and there, for which there's a demand within your own borders? infrastructure we know continues to be an issue and it doesn't have to be you know are you in a position to build a dam or a road um, not everybody's in a position to do that but the infrastructure itself creates any number of spin-off opportunities so even though you may not be in a position to build a road you might be in a position to think about the toll collecting for the road and think about technology that could collect those tolls you might be in a position to think about ways in which um, if there's a dam, does it need to have a communication, the emergency communication notification for the area around it um, in case that dam should suffer a break and you need to communicate? Is there something that you do? Are you special from the digital standpoint? And do you have an understanding of how to create that type of a communication messaging platform? Um, the need for more infrastructure creates not only the large projects that um, constitute that infrastructure, but a number of spin-off opportunities as well. Um, agriculture, we hear it in every conversation about opportunities on the continent. And again, much like my point earlier in terms of our own self-reliance, uh, this is a moment in particular when we need to be mindful of the need to produce our own food and to improve food security on the continent. And this is something that's just going to continue to grow as the population grows. And so this again presents an opportunity if you're thinking about scale, um, you know, a rising tide is gonna lift all boats as, as the continent becomes, uh, as demand for agriculture increases and there's an increasing desire to be self-reliant those who are in that sector will just simply succeed. You don't necessarily have to be brilliant. You don't have to outsmart everybody else. Uh, that rising tide will lift all the members of that sector. So are you a part of that sector? Are you a part of a sector that's going to benefit from a rising tide? And moving on to digital. Um, digital is another one where those who come up with the right digital solutions um, are going to benefit from the digitization that is um, occurring across the continent. We all use these terms and talk about leapfrogging, and this is a moment when that leapfrogging is going to take place. Uh, this is when we see how consumer trends um, will have a, you know, a tremendous impact on, uh, on a life as we know it, because we're looking for ways to avoid contact, we're looking for ways to socially, to be more socially distant, and again, there are a number of ways that our be consumer behaviors are changing uh, within the pandemic that are here to stay. Uh, we recently did a session on this on Africa.com and looked at all sorts of digital trends that are here to stay. For example, contactless payments, not wanting to touch um, cash. Are there opportunities in the payment system space? Uh, we looked at other trends. We looked at trends such as delivery um, people wanting to protect themselves because we know this pandemic is going to continue. This is a moment when companies like Uber Eats have really benefited and Jumia have really benefited from their logistics and ability to get things to people. Uh, so we just think about how that, you know, which, which uh, industries are going to benefit 
from that rising tide and put yourself in that space because you will rise along with the tide. Um, a fourth comment, with my background as an investment banker, I just always feel the need to say a word or two about finance and entrepreneurs because so often you hear entrepreneurs say that they can't succeed because they don't have fun funding. What can I do because I don't have funding? The banks aren't giving me money. I can't get venture capital. And what, what am I going to do? And I often point out that the best business ideas fund themselves. And you don't have the hassle, pressure, or dilution that comes from debt or equity. Sometimes getting money can be a curse for a business. And I've seen this many, many times to have a pretty strong view on this issue. Um, you know, it's nice to get outside finance because you can oftentimes grow faster than you would otherwise if you have a good investor who, who's aligned, whose vision is aligned with your own, they may be able to add additional benefits to your business beyond just the financing. They may serve as a board member, they can make introductions, they are invested in your future. And so they are motivated to help you find new buyers, they're help, motivated to help you attract the best staff. So it, I don't mean to in any way um, negate the value of a very good investor and the benefit and impact that they can have on your business. But I think that we often know those stories. The stories we don't hear about are the stories where the investor is not aligned with your vision and you end up spending your time managing the investor instead of uh, managing the business. We don't hear about those situations where people are pushed aside because the investor doesn't think that the founder is the right person anymore. Maybe they you know, and that's a common issue. You know, sometimes founders really are not the right people to take the business forward. But I've seen many founders take in outside investment and then be shocked and surprised when they get fired from their own companies because the investors wanted to see somebody else go forward with a, a different view. Um, there are any number of constraints that come with that. Uh, you, if you borrow debt, you now have to make sure that you service that debt instead of building the business. Um, sometimes that money you might have been able to grow, uh, maybe a little bit slower, but more effectively in the long term, if you had reinvested the money in the business rather than servicing debt. So I think that um, you know, as part of the idea when you're scaling your business is to think about whether there's a way to focus on a, on a business model, a revenue model that funds the business itself so that you're not reliant on somebody else's decision to fund you or not. If you create enough cash flow and you grow the business through internal growth, then that again gives you, coming back to one of the earlier themes, it gives you a tremendous amount of independence. And so you're able to do with the business what you like, not what investors necessarily want you to do with the business. Um, so I strongly encourage people to think hard about it. And when you're an entrepreneur and you're struggling and you're figuring out how to make ends meet, the idea of outside funding is something that sounds very attractive and something that you may have been praying for, but you know you have to be careful what you wish for because sometimes you might get it and not be as happy as if you had had to work through that um, independently. So don't let the inability of outside finance uh, keep you from your dreams and recognize that when you're successful, you may actually pre uh, prefer to have done it on your own because you would still own 100% of your company instead of having had to negotiate during a weak moment and give a large give away a large portion of it. So um, that's one thing I always just like to mention to entrepreneurs as I think about scaling. And then um, for my fifth point, which I'll provide a little introduction to before moving to the fifth point, the fifth consideration. Uh, the fifth consideration is around timing. And uh, I brought someone along to uh, share that point with you. I'm going to uh, share the words of a Silicon Valley venture capitalist, a very successful one who spent some time thinking about this question of timing. And so um, let's just go there and hear what he has to say. Let's hope the technology works. Let's try to roll it now and let's see. What factors actually matter the most for startup success? 
first the idea. I used to think that the idea was everything. But then over time, I came to think that maybe the team, the execution, adaptability, that mattered even more than the idea. Then I started looking at the business model. Does the company have a very clear path generating customer revenues? Then I looked at the funding. Sometimes companies received intense amount of funding. And then, of course, the timing. Is it early, meaning you're in advance and you have to educate the world? Is it just right or is it too late and there's already too many competitors? So first, the top five companies, City Search, Cars Direct, GoTo, Net Zero, Tickets.com, those all became billion dollar successes. And the five companies on the bottom, we all had high hopes for, but didn't succeed. I looked at wild successes like Airbnb and Instagram and Uber and YouTube and LinkedIn. The number one thing was timing. Timing accounted for 42% of the difference between success and failure. Team and execution came in second, and the idea, that actually came in third. The last two, business model and funding, made sense to me, actually. You could start out without a business model and then add one later if your customers are demanding what you're creating. And funding, if you're underfunded at first, but you're gaining traction, it's very, very easy to get intense funding. So take a wild success like Airbnb. That company came out right during the height of the recession when people really needed extra money. We started a company called Z.com. It was an online entertainment company. We were so excited about it. We raised enough money. We had a great business model. But broadband penetration was too low in 1999, 2000. It was too hard to watch video content online. And the company eventually went out of business in 2003. So what I would say in summary is execution definitely matters a lot. The idea matters a lot. But timing might matter even more. I think startups can change the world and make the world a better place. Thank you very much. My great audience. Okay, so um, those are my points, is that timing is so critical and recognize that you might have the most brilliant idea and the longer version of that, he speaks about how he'd also invested in a company very similar to Airbnb, um, but it was about timing. It came out before uh, the recession and it just, it folded. But you know, by Airbnb hitting the market at that particular moment when um, the recession came about and people who had homes wanted to earn extra income because they needed it. And the fact that uh, people were traveling and they didn't have as much money to stay in hotels and so they were looking for a less expensive option, it just hit the market at the right time. So the Airbnb of five years earlier failed, but the Airbnb that launched in the recession was the one that succeeded. So you recognize that there's uh, you know, some luck in all of this. You can sometimes control your luck and your timing. Sometimes you can't, but don't beat yourself up if you're ahead of the market. Maybe you have an idea that's too brilliant and ahead of its time and try to hang in there and bring it back at the moment that uh, the market might be with you. So those are my five considerations for scaling your business. I hope that some of those are, are useful as um, all the entrepreneurs on this call seek to become one of those billion dollar companies in Africa and take that number from 400 to 401. So I wish you well, thank you. Teresa, thank you so much. But before you leave us, you know, you're talking about uh, luck. I mean, you, you, you kind of breeze through it a little bit and they say that luck is when opportunity means uh, meets preparation. Well, um, we were not prepared for COVID-19, it is here. But there's so many um, entrepreneurs, so many um, SMEs that have been trying and failing and trying and failing. From your perspective of a successful business owner, um, how much advantage should we take um, of COVID-19 and what it more or less presents to us? Yeah, you know, it's a very good question. And I think that there are many ways to look at it, I think, in different geographies and in different sectors. And so, for example, the themes around self-reliance that COVID teach us, teaches, has taught us, is teaching us, and will continue to teach us, I think is um, something to be mindful of. Certainly, you know, starting very close to home, it's, a, it's, a, it's both the humanitarian crisis and an economic crisis, but at the end of the day, it's a medical uh, challenge. And so I think that it has laid bare the challenges that we have for healthcare on the continent. And we're seeing opportunities around telemedicine um, that have existed before, but in this moment are being accelerated. There's a lot of some of the opportunities that are occurring today are not things that people just thought of all of a sudden, but people who've been working in the telemedicine space for years 
are, are now able to be heard and people recognize the value. I'd say the same thing is true for distance education. Um, we've long had this concept and idea that we could use technology to, um, to improve education in places where people don't have access to good teachers and to the same infrastructure. But now we have people, and it's not just for poor rural people, but wealthy urban people are all being forced to learn online because of the pandemic. And so that helps to accelerate an acceptance of the, of the online education model, which I think will hopefully have uh, the benefit of extending those resources to a broader community and, and helping to improve rural education and education in places that don't have resources. So I think that you know, the pandemic creates any number of opportunities and, and some of those opportunities are gonna go to people who've been thinking about these problems for a long time. You know, I mean, there may be some people who jump in now and have an idea, but there are people who've been working in healthcare and education and toiling for years with these ideas um, and not just ideas, but implementing. And I think that their benefits are going to be, um, I'm sorry, that their, their investments are going to benefit from the moment. Teresa Clark, thank you so much for spending um, your time with us. And now, well, you know, there's always a silver lining. So we, we're almost grateful that we were compelled to have this festival online so we could have the likes of you and other respected um, contributors joining us um, all the way from the other side of the world. Um, technology has a powerful way of bringing us all together. But most importantly, thank you so much for your time, your nuggets of wisdom. Um, and we do look forward to having you again. Well, thank you. I hope to be able to join you again. I wish you well with the rest of your very dynamic program. You put together a wonderful conference and uh, I'll try to see if I can jump in for some more great conversations later in the day.